we'll get started. I'm I'm really excited to have um, Chief Brown and, and Jeremy from Hostler today to talk about something that maybe you're not really aware of. It's uh, enhancing road safety with digital alerting. Most of you are thinking like, what the heck is that? Um, but unfortunately, struck by incidents and collisions are one of the leading cause of deaths for firefighters, along with other first responders, tow truck drivers, and other people that are serving society. Um, kind of asking, why is this happening? I'm just as guilty as some of the rest of us where distracted drivers, distracted driving is a serious problem where you have people that are just on the road, not really looking on the looking at what they're looking at, instead looking at their smartphone. Granted, we were able to do quite a bit of awesome stuff with the smartphone. Having said that, it's causing a lot of issues for first responders. So without further ado, I guess a quick intro on myself. I'm the, one of the co-founders of Smart Firefighting, and we're excited to have you in this virtual chat. But I'm more excited to have both Jeremy and Chief Brown here. So if you could both give a little bit of an introduction on who you are and, and what you do, and then we'll dive a little bit more into the actual problem and um, some of the solutions here with this issue. Chief, right. why don't you go ahead first, yeah. Uh, Brad Brown, Assistant Fire Chief in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, so we're a mid-sized Midwestern city, about 200,000 people, 45.3 uh, square miles, 11 fire stations, 15 frontline apparatus, a lot of uh, little red cars and a reserve uh, fleet to go along with that. Uh, my role is uh, fire stations, fire apparatus, planning, and budgeting. And you'll see later why this is so near and dear to my heart is what we're trying to do with digital alerting is address many of those issues that I face on a pretty routine basis, unfortunately, with uh, apparatus, uh, fire stations, and budget implications of uh, a fire truck or first responder being struck. So that is that is why I'm here. Thanks, Chief. Yep. And Jeremy. hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Jeremy Agulnik. I'm the vice president of Connected Car here at House Alert. I've been with the company for about three years now. Um, I, I'm responsible actually for talking uh, in, to the automotive industry. So getting them to uh, incorporate uh, our alerts into the vehicle um, so that more drivers can receive these alerts. Um, you know, and also talking to you know the navigation platforms, traffic providers, um, you know, ride sharing companies, really anyone that has a driver facing interface or interaction. Um, that that's that's the that's what I do on a day to day basis. Um, I also work with a lot of the larger manufacturers and solution providers within the public safety industry um, to get to get them to more at scale incorporate digital alerting into their trucks and, and vehicles and solutions. So. Think of the you know, fire truck manufacturers um, working with them to add digital alerting as a standard safety feature to their you know, new fire trucks. Thanks, Jeremy. So Jeremy and Chief Brown, as I mentioned earlier, smartphones might be one of the biggest problems here of why we have an issue with distracted driving. But in, in your own words, why is this a problem? And, and maybe give us some stats and some context on sort of this, the severity of this problem of distracted driving and the need to enhance road safety. So, yeah. so Jeremy can do the stats. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll give the anecdotal uh, type of information. And it's been a little while since I've driven a big red truck. I do have a little red car now, uh, but I can tell you, it doesn't matter how bright the lights are, how loud the sirens are, people don't see and or hear you. Um, we've tried to address this through multiple mediums, um, traffic preemption, do, doing multiple different things in route to an emergency. And not only is it distracted driving, but the cars are so much better made now. They're so quiet. Yeah. Even in the city car that I have, if you have the radio up even just a little bit, you don't hear an ambulance or police car until they're right on top of you. Now, as first responders, we drive with our head on a swivel. We're always looking down the road. A lot of people don't do that. So... I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but people do not see and hear us going down the road. Yeah, and in terms of some some stats, you know, at at a at the high level, um, you know, the the U.S. Department of Transportation and Highway Safety, uh, they uh, they believe that there is roughly fifty thousand collisions a year between civilian drivers and emergency vehicles and first responders. Uh, we actually believe that number is much more. So just anecdotally talking to departments across the country, 
Um, you know, we, we know that that 50,000 number is way underreported. Uh, we, we think it's closer to roughly 100,000 uh, a year. Um, you, you know, and even though all 50 states now have move over laws and, and you're know, requiring people to slow down and or move over, um, you know, it's not making things any better. Um, and, and to Chief Brown's point too, you know, drivers have less than three seconds from the time they you know, see a, an emergency vehicle to make a decision, right? Because of the quiet cars, they don't hear the sirens. Because of the distracted driving, um, you know, they don't see the lights in time. So, you know, that, that less than three second time period that they have to make you know, effectively a split second decision is, uh, is very dangerous. Wow, and I, I saw a graph that someone on your team sent me and maybe I think it might be useful to pull it up to kind of humanize it where you talked about having these great BMWs that are silent and you can't hear anything, uh, which is a feature, but except what about when the first responders are trying to do their job and then all of a sudden you kill a tow truck driver or you kill an EMS worker. Yeah. God forbid, that sounds like my nightmare, um, but this, this graph in this chart really kind of struck a chord with me and I'm going to pull it up and I would love uh, Chief Brown if you can maybe kind of give us a little context here I mean and, and Jeremy as well as you look at this map what what am I what am I seeing and, and sort of what does this tell me here it, it, it's it's a somber chart that you put up there and we spoke about this yesterday these aren't people that almost got struck these aren't people that got struck and got injured uh, these, these are these are deaths. Uh, a lot of these people did not go home. And when you really start to look at this and think about our work out on the roadway, even though I'm biased to to the fire service, it's the police officers, it's the tow truck drivers, it's the paramedics out on the street, and then it's the motoring public. <clears throat> How can we prevent them from getting further injured? running into our emergency scene. So taking a much more macro view, it's not just us that we're trying to protect. We need to protect the motoring public as well. And how do we do that? And I, I truly think digital alerting is primed to be ready to fill that gap because there is a gap right now. And that's evidenced by these names and faces we're seeing on the screen. Kevin, so Kevin, one of the other stats that, that we you know, at how is that uh, you know, vehicle collisions are actually the number one leading cause of death and injury for first responders. So it's not it's not it's not the fighting of fires. It's not the chasing down of, of bad guys you know, by police. It's it's collisions with other vehicles while they're either en route uh, and, and you know, probably more tragically while they're on scene stopped out of their vehicles. That's when the, the danger really escalates. Well, and I can confirm that, Jeremy, because I've had multiple conversations with my crews they feel much more exposed and much more at risk operating on US 131 running right through downtown Grand Rapids than they do in a house fire any day of the week. We've said that on the media. We've said that with some of our move over campaigns. That is a very dangerous place to be working as the roadway. Not that fires aren't dangerous, but we feel that fire behavior is more predictable than driving behavior of the general public. And, and the fact that you guys use, you know, fire engines in a blocker position to literally sacrifice themselves to absorb collisions, you know, that that, that in and of itself says you're put plunking down, you know, quarter of a million, half a million dollar vehicles out there just to prevent collisions with the other with the other folks that are further up the road. I mean, and you talk about how we, we put these blocker vehicles up just to act as literally like a blocker, like an O lineman blocking a quarterback. But as I look at here, it's, it puts a pin in my stomach as I click these different people. And it's, again, back to the firefighter health and wellness. These are all very preventable deaths. And I, I, I want to dive more into that. But I think just as I click between these different, um, these different topics, between tow truck driver, between fire, between EMS, um, are there differences in the threats or... I mean, is it the commonalities is that people are distracted, but what are some of the maybe just little nuances of differences of threats compared to tow truck drivers, police, EMS, fire, or a road safety worker? I think a lot of it goes to how quickly you can get that traffic slowed down around you. And like Jeremy went back to the three seconds uh, reaction time. If someone looks up and they are right on top of you, they don't have time to react appropriately. So we try to stage, at least in the fire service, we're staging 
well back from the accident scene. But at that point, you have to worry about people going around the blocker and back into the accident scene. So there's a fine line with this. And unfortunately, some of these people that didn't make it home had blockers behind them, right? The, the blocker is not the answer to everything. It's, it's one way to help protect us, but this is a multifaceted problem and we have to approach it through multiple mediums. And next time you're on the roadway, really, and, and you see you pass by an emergency vehicle or a tow truck stopped on the side of the road, just take a look at how many people aren't slowing down soon enough, or maybe the last second they're jackknifing into the next lane, you know, introducing an even greater, you know, safety risk there. Uh, you know, people just aren't, either aren't wanting to do it or aren't seeing it um, in time. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you know, so, so, so getting that warning to them in advance is, is critically important. So you speak of this warning in advance. Um, I, I hear that and I mean, I think about how many alerts I get on my cell phone from Instagram notification, LinkedIn notification to I have an update for Microsoft to gosh, who knows what my aunt's doing on Facebook, like all, all these different things that exist where I, I feel like we're inundated with, with updates, but we talk about this issue with digital alerting for road safety. What is digital alerting? And how is it actually being done from a hardware and software integration standpoint? And, and sort of how can fire departments start using this technology, which is available today? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you want to pull up the slides uh, that I have, Kevin. Is that a yep? Yeah, um, yeah. So, so look, we've what Hustler has done is we've built a cloud-based platform um, that tracks the real-time location of responding emergency vehicles, tow trucks maintenance trucks, construction vehicles, anything that uses sirens or lights to traditionally get the attention of drivers. Uh, we're, those vehicles are, are connected to our platform and we're pushing these alerts out to um, the, the navigation apps and, and vehicles um, in order to tri deliver those alerts to the driver. Um, today, you know, we are, uh, we're working with Waze um, is our first, uh, what we call digital alerting partner. Um, this is actually what the alert looks like when your phone running Waze is plugged into the to the head unit of your vehicle, right? It's a nice big screen. Um, you see a, a warning message popping up. There's a, you know, even on the screen, there's like a pulsating blue signal identifying that hazard on the road. Um, there, there's an audible alert that can come up as well. Uh, so it really is in, intended to get the attention of that driver. Uh, and, and you see here, it's, you know, in this example, it's 0.3 miles in advance. That's plenty of time for that driver to receive that warning, slow down, look around, and then you'll know, make a, a safe driving decision based on you know, whatever's going on around them. Um, you know, we're, we're not, we're, we don't want the driver to, to you know, automatically do the same thing every time because every condition is, is a little different. Um, you know, so what we've also built, um, and this is you know, Chief Brown and his team and other de or, you know, departments that we were working with earlier, um, gave us some really good feedback and said, hey, you know, you know, yeah, civilian, you're getting civilian driver attention is really important. Um, but we also, you know, get in a lot of close calls and sometimes accidents with other responding emergency vehicles. Um, so we've actually gone ahead and built a responder to responder alerting network, uh, which is the first ever kind of private network for emergency vehicles to communicate with each other. It's for police, fire and EMS specifically uh, within a municipality or, or in surrounding municipalities to warn each other when there's a potential collision um, uh, amongst, uh, amongst those responding vehicles. So again, it's another safety element to address you know, first responders uh, specifically here. Yeah, Jeremy, I'll jump in there and just say, that was a really good innovation uh, that your team and, and Grand Rapids kind of worked together on because we know where our fire trucks are at. We know the routes they take. We see our fire trucks on the laptops and the rigs. Um, we do have quite a few blind intersections downtown and in certain parts of town. Um, so we're pretty good about knowing where each other is at, but then you have someone from a different agency. We have two private ambulance companies in town and obviously uh, the Grand Rapids Police Department. And we've had multiple very close calls with those other agencies um, almost running into us or us almost running into them. Yep. And speaking with some other very large fire departments across this country, uh, we've all seen the videos on YouTube where two fire trucks collide. Um, it's so dangerous, uh, a, a great risk to our responders, to the citizens, 
And then at the end of the day, we have to pick up the pieces and try to get trucks back in service. Yeah. And that is costly and a lengthy process as well. So this was a really cool feature that you guys uh, worked on. Yeah. And, and I can also imagine just kind of the public embarrassment when, you know, two you know, public safety vehicles from the same city hit each other. Uh, yeah. Sure that, that doesn't make the mayors proud to uh, talk yeah. about that. I mean, a car crash is never a good thing, but especially when you have two yeah. pretty expensive fire apparatus, it's never. Yeah. And, and, and Kevin, you, you asked a moment ago about kind of you know, the hardware required. So uh, we've actually got two, two different ways to activate a, an emergency vehicle onto the safety cloud. Uh, one is using our transponder, which you see pictured here on the top left. Um, it's, it has a cellular modem in it, a GPS antenna. So it's really meant to be uh, kind of a standalone um, you know, technology that isn't reliant on anything else in the truck um, to, to activate the vehicle that way. Um, it takes about 30 minutes to, to install uh, into the vehicle. Uh, we also have a hardware less based um, activation method using our HA Direct, uh, which is really just a, a software integration with existing telematics or CAD or other type of, of, of technologies that you may already have on the truck that can get the location information about the vehicle and the warning light status that we, that we need to, to run our service. So two different options there. Um, and then that R to R, responder to responder alert that we talked about, um, that's what those lights look like. Um, in, in a larger vehicles like a fire truck, they would both get mounted on the A pillars on both sides. Um, in smaller vehicles, there could just be one mounted on the, on the dash in the front. Um, so, so it's pretty flexible there as well. Chief Brown, you want to talk about the, the dashboard? Yeah, so the dashboard was another feature that um, that we worked on together. And this really came out of Grand Rapids going out to a lot of other departments and seeing really cool CAD integration uh, up on TVs in, in the uh, fire stations. And with our current CAD vendor, it was going to be really expensive to do that. And so we went back to Haas and just said, look, you know the location of our vehicles. We know where the station is. Can you guys build something to display that? And and you did, and it's clean and it's simple. And I can tell you as a duty chief, when I get a call from dispatch, um, you know, at two in the morning and we have a, a two alarm fire going, I go to this dashboard to see where my units are at and how many units are there. So if I have 13 to 15 units on the scene of an emergency, and I only have two for the whole city, I know I need to move them central and move other units in. So not only, I think Haas is simply an alerting tool. Um, I, I don't think that fully captures what it's doing for me right now. It's more of a situational awareness uh, tool as well. So the dashboard uh, works well for that. It's, it's simple, it's clean, it's easy to implement, um, obviously, uh, we run about 25,000 runs a year, take about 33,000 apparatus responses to mitigate those. So every 24 hours, we're running quite a few incidents. Um, but it's nice as a battalion chief to look up and see different clusters, see what's going on. Just get, again, just get a feel of what's going on this in, in the city without having to have my laptop, without firing that up. All this, I run off my phone. I run all this off my smartphone. Uh, so if I'm at City Hall in a meeting and something's going down, I just pull out the phone and look at it. So it's it's a very useful tool for us. Actually, I, I just talked to a police department earlier today, and, and they don't actually have any fleet tracking on their system. So you know, one of the the bigger appeals of the Haas Alert solution for them, you know, in addition to the safety and digital alerting, was actually the dashboard and the, and the fleet tracking uh, and situational awareness capabilities. Yeah, and, and then this last one. Um, we normally average 10 to 15,000 uh, alerts a month to drivers. Uh, we're down right now. I, I was telling these guys yesterday, um, we have purchased about 15 apparatus in the last six months. We're turning our fleet over. So a lot of the devices are in transit where this rig's not in service. So we haven't taken the host device off and put it in the new rig yet. So we're seeing a little dip right now for Grand Rapids. Um, but it's interesting to look at the the monthly and the year to date and, and the total. And I can tell you uh, the the curve is exponential at this point. We were one of the first in the country to run this technology. And 
right after we implemented it, people would say, well, how's it working? And we just would say, well, we don't know yet. You know, this is very early into this situation. But as you're getting integrated with Google Ways, as this software is getting into different car manufacturers, as this is coming out on new fire trucks as standard equipment for a lot of different manufacturers, we're, we're reaching critical mass with this digital alerting. And I think we're going to continue to see this go up. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, we are alerting a lot of people. Hey, we're coming down the road or watch out. We're already at the scene of an emergency. And it's nice to see these numbers go up. Yep. It seems like that's, that's kind of maybe the, the initial premise of Haas where it was just a matter of there is a first responder going from point A to point B or the first responder is already at point B and we are just communicating Hey, be aware. And that's uh, one of the questions from Kevin Darley is what's that look like for me as a civilian? To me, when I saw it, it's basically an integration to my mapping that says, hey, be aware. You know, we're not trying to take your eyes off the road. It's just a matter of increasing that yes. response and awareness time. So as opposed to drag racing around this corner right here, you instead are being a little bit more aware and yep. to make sure you're not hitting a first responder. Yep. And, and and Kevin, like this is exactly what it looks like right here, right? This is this is a live alert you know, that we took a screenshot of, um, of of a hazard that was in uh, actually I think that's in Grand Rapids. Yeah, that, that is. I'm mistaken. Yeah, and that and that was one of the interesting points um, when we first started started rolling this out. We would get the feedback of so. Let me get this straight. You want to alert me on my cell phone to take my eyes off the road and i said no that's not the point the point is your eyes are already not on the road <laughs> now i'm telling you you really need to focus in and see yeah. what's happening so that as this becomes integrated these are the yeah. alerts that you're used to it's nothing unusual we're interacting with these as drivers daily so it really does just kind of run in the background uh, uh, unobtrusive and just says hey heads up and I, and I will tell you, the first iteration of this was we have traffic preemption in Grand Rapids at 130 some intersections. We're already changing the lights, changing the flow of traffic. But one thing that we didn't realize is how many bicyclists, how many pedestrians have the earbuds in? Jeremy, you're wearing them right now. How many people are next to the roadway? and aren't aware or plugged in and still don't hear or see us coming down the road. So this was yet another way to alert people not in a car that, hey, somebody's coming down the road, be aware, take an extra second to look at that intersection. So it gets pretty dicey driving uh, downtown on a Friday night with the bar traffic. So it's yeah. nice to have yet another way to communicate with the public of watch out, you know, there's something going on in that area. Is a continuing question. Does this alert civilians to the location of the apparatus in motion to the scene, or is it focused primarily on the scene itself? Yeah, th this is focused on the apparatus. So it's yeah. it's strictly, you know, as the vehicle's traveling to the scene, there's a, a warning about that moving vehicle. Mm -hmm. And then once that vehicle's arrived on scene, um, it now changes to an on scene alert. Um, it, it visually looks pretty similar. Um, but, but yeah, we're really tracking the vehicle itself, uh, both, uh, in both scenarios and route and on scene. Yeah. And that was kind of an organic thing of it. First, we wanted to make sure we got there safely because obviously everyone that drives a fire apparatus has had some yep. close calls getting to the scene. And then as you'll see here in a couple of minutes, we had a lot of incidents, negative incidents take place when we're stationary. And that's where we worked with Haas to put that virtual geofence or that safety bubble around us. And once a motorist crosses or pedestrian or bicyclist crosses that threshold, then they get the alert. Just like this. Hey, as you're getting up to Leonard Street, be aware there's a fire truck up there working just to let you know. So it's it's been a nice um, innovation. That's good. Well, uh, I guess I want to encourage everyone uh, to continue to ask questions, but I think that that's good for the, this presentation here. And that what it seemed like we took like a nice macro discussion here. And what I'd like to do is really now is zone in on the town of Grand Rapids. Um, I actually was just nearby the area not too long ago, up in the Upper Peninsula, beautiful area. And 
I think that it'd be good to understand really the granular reason of why you have this technology and then start to talk about why other fire departments and why other police and tow truck drivers can use this. Um, because I know one, probably one thing I want you to talk about quickly is the adoption of this tech. I think people, they hear new tech and they're like, oh God, I'm going to rip my head out. I need a, I need a millennial techie to take care of this. Like you actually don't. So just quickly address the challenge to adopt and then why it's something that is just running in the background. Um, Chief, you went, um, your audio just- There we go. Uh, We're good. There we go. Um, being in charge of the planning division that loves tech and loves, loves the new whiz bang stuff, um, we've evaluated a lot of different things, but also being on the streets, I can tell you, our officers don't need one more thing to do on the scene. Our drivers do not need one more thing to like, literally, I do not want them to even have to hit a button when they're in route because I want them focused on the task at hand. And when we first started working with Haas, that was a that was a pretty staunch stance that we took in Grand Rapids is, look, we'll use this. We believe in the concept, but it has to be firefighter proof, which means I need a black box that sits there and does its thing and requires zero input from my people because they already have a job to do. And Haas, you guys knocked it out of the park. I mean, it took some revisions, some mm -hmm. beta testing and some different things, but our people literally have forgotten that this is on the rig. Like it's, it's up on the dash. It requires zero input. Every now and then one may drop off and we'll lose the signal and we'll go out and re restart it or reset it. But that's, it's rare. Like these things require no input from us. And that was really the starting point or the guardrails for this project. Um, I don't know if you want to cue the video. Yeah, I'll cue the video. And I'll say one might say that's the definition of set it and forget it. Yeah, is. exactly. Ron Popeil, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to start the video. Uh, there might be a little bit of audio feedback, so I might have to change something here shortly. Um, but I'm going to start the video. It's about two minutes long, and I hope you guys enjoy. Firefighting is one of the most dangerous jobs yeah. around. We saw it earlier in the week when two Crockery Township firefighters were hurt from an electrical shock. Well, early this morning, a Grand Rapids firefighter had a close call with a driver while working a different traffic accident. 24 Hour News 8's Joe Lafergi has this story. Try to figure this one out. That driver missed all the flashing lights at that accident scene. The firefighter jumped out of the way, and not a moment too soon. How do you miss? a big red truck with a bunch of lights on it that's, that's a great question but the reality is is that fire trucks are getting hit across the country almost every day in a few seconds somebody not paying attention can cover a lot of distance and it's too late early friday morning it was on the east belt line near burton grfd pd and an ambulance crew were working a crash GRFD was using this engine as a blocker. It's a safety procedure in which at least one and usually two fire department vehicles are used to block traffic several yards in front of a crash. This placing of this piece of equipment by our crews actually creates a shallow to work in, but ultimately probably, uh, if not seriously injured, um, prevented some uh, deaths potentially to responders and also the people who were in the original accident. It's a common problem in Grand Rapids and in the suburbs. We first told you back in 2010 about the three Grand Rapids ladder trucks that had been hit on the S-curve in less than a year. The city was running out of spares. GRFD eventually got an old water department dump truck that was about to be sold at auction, painted it red, and put a big shock absorber on the back. Not only does it save damage to more expensive rigs. I think it gets people's attention. Um, and that's what we're really trying to do. We're trying to get people's attention. And the training for firefighters has been modified over the years. There's a reason that firefighter who was placing traffic cones behind the engine right before it was hit today was able to jump out of the way. He didn't turn his back on traffic. An example would be I would never be putting cones out like this because the traffic's back here. I want to actually set the cones out and drop the cones down. Why? Because if somebody does something that I can get out of the way. We found a website that tracks firefighter injury and death across the nation. Some of the reasons may surprise you. We have a link to that site at woodtv.com. In Grand Rapids, Joel Lefer, G, 24 hours. 24 hours eight. eight. So, so that's a great intro and summation of the case study. And I'll, I'll just provide a little more context. 
Um, starting about 10 years ago, um, obviously we've had close calls before then, but we had a rash of close calls where we had members literally jumping out of the way on the highway, um, over barricades, um, very, very lucky that we did not have some serious injuries. We had a few minor injuries and that started to get our attention. And we started to obviously wear the safety vest, put the cones out in a different manner, start the blocking procedures, um, reevaluate re our roadway policies. We had three aerial trucks hit in one year. The third one was actually an, uh, a platform we borrowed from the neighboring city because we were out of trucks. We got their truck hit. So needless to say, they weren't very pleased with it. Um, and, and neither were we. And we said, we have to do something. So we went a little further upstream and said, look, we can't afford to get our expensive stuff hit. And that's where the, the utility to the, the city dump truck idea came from. We still run that today. That thing goes out two to three times a day on any roadway above 55 miles per hour. The neighboring city to the south of us now has one and we have a mutual aid agreement. Um, MDOT assists us and reimburses us for response, uh, Michigan uh, DOT. And it's been a really good partnership that still didn't address the problem. Utility two gets struck three, four or five times a year. Some of these are minor glancing blows where we pop a tire, uh, it's a dump truck, so if we get a dent, we, we don't really care. Two, three times a year, that scorpion on the back gets completely smashed. We tow it back to the shop. They have a new one to us within 12 hours. We put it back on the road. We're still getting hit. We've gone further back up the highway and say, where, where's the line of sight? Where can you not see on this highway? And we have marks for our utility two driver. If there's a wreck between Franklin and Wealthy, you're gonna park at this location. I mean, we've mapped all these different things out and we feel like we're doing about everything we can. The only thing we can do, and this goes right back to Jeremy's point, we have to let people know sooner. And that's why when Haas approached us years ago, looking for a beta test site, we were jumping all over it because we said, obviously we're addressing some pieces of the response continuum with these countermeasures, with the different policies, with the lighting, with the vest, with the, with the blocking, with all these different things, but we're still not getting to the root cause of distracted driving and or early notification. And that, that, that's where this comes in. So for me, um, it's the safety of our, our men and women on, on the, out on the roadway. It's also trying to keep trucks on the road in Grand Rapids. We don't have a bunch of spares sitting around um, we run a pretty tight budget, pretty tight ship around here. So when I get a truck or engine or, or something struck and it's out of service for six months to a year getting repaired, it's crippling to me. So that's why we're so invested in this digital digital alerting process. It, we, we believe that it's going to help mitigate some of those factors. And, and, and from a cost perspective, you know, if, if one collision is avoided in a five year period, Oh, you know, that's going to pay for the service 10 times over. I mean, the, the ROI. Times on it over, is, yeah. 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 Um, you know, we, we also, you know, in, in, in talking to other departments and, and you guys too, I mean, uh, you know, a lot of municipalities have, you know, traffic signal preemption, right? Where the lights yeah. change. Um, you're doing a lot of things uh, to, you know, like, like you just uh, described, but a lot of those are not getting to the root of the problem of the driver simply not paying attention. So right. that that's why Haas Alert exists, right? We we wanted to get at the main root of the problem of drivers aren't paying attention, they're not aware. So let's make them aware through their phones, through their cars. Yeah, I always like to say the utility program we run is doing the wrong thing rider. You know, right. it, we know we're gonna get hit, so we're gonna get something really cheap hit that we don't really care about. It's still not the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to tell people, hey, we're up here, watch out. And we're still waiting on that critical mass of motorists getting these alerts. Yeah. But I'm telling you, as this continues to ramp up, yeah. I think we're going to start to see less and less collisions on the road. Well, well the, good, the good news with all the fire truck manufacturers now, right? Pierce, Rosenbauer, Seagrave, KME, Ferrara, and E1, all adding Hostler as a standard safety feature to their new trucks. You know, the, the ramp up period is, is, is going to happen uh, you know, much more quickly. Yeah. yeah. And Chief, um, give us a little context in terms of some of the different value for different types of departments. I mean, Grand Rapids is maybe a little different than 
a small town in Nebraska or the city of Seattle. Uh, right. What are the differences of how they would use it? I saw that report had a couple different notes. You had mentioned that you use some of it, not all of it, but other departments might. Just a little bit of small, medium, large department use case and value prop. Yeah, so I think for smaller departments, um, we're very fortunate in Grand Rapids to have a planning division, which I helped start about a decade ago. So we're really into the data, the record management system, lo looking at all that sort of stuff. A smaller department may not have those resources, likely doesn't. So the Haas dashboard does give you the, the average response time, the number of incidents, number, you know, all these different things that a smaller department can access for a really low, a, a low fee. And that I think that would be appealing to them. I also think not having a tech person on staff all the time, it plays right into how easy the system is to operate. It, it is plug and play. And although I do have a couple IT people that work for the department that can handle this, it's much easier to not have to handle it at all. So for me, it, it is a mid-sized department. Um, it was keeping my trucks in service. It was letting people know, hey, we're on the way. Let's look at response times. How can we get there quicker? And then I did talk with some larger departments and they were having a lot of the fire trucks um, in the big cities, the, the limited sight line, they were experiencing a lot of those responder to responder accidents where I don't really have a lot of that here, but I could see in a much larger system that taking place. So Haas, go, the, the, the digital learning serves, serves you where you're at. I guess I'll, I'll say that. Different departments are gonna take away different pieces from it. For me, out on US 131 and 196, that virtual bubble is probably more important than telling people I'm driving down the road. Because I have good drivers, they drive defensively. It's important, but I keep getting stuff struck and my people almost keep getting hit on the roadway. So for me, that's probably, if I had to pick one feature, that would be it. For a department without traffic preemption, this may be the most cost-effective way to tell people you're in route. Please watch out. Well said. Yeah, I mean, I, to me as an outsider, I think just anything we can do to keep the trucks in in safe safe uh, safe control and making sure that first responders are safer and reducing risk that seems to be pretty logical means of why this should be adopted. Um, so I, I guess it's kind of a theoretical question to you. I mean, why wouldn't a fire department adopt this? Or what is there, is there, is it just like the budget or doing something new? It, it, it's, I'm struggling to realize, think why this isn't on every fire truck um, in every type of growing public works truck out there. I mean, on the surface, change, change is difficult. There's always the, the, next, the next best thing out there. There's always new technology coming out. And at some point, I think you reach saturation with what you're willing to test out. Um, there's a lot of departments using this right now that have done the testing, have believed in this process. And if you look at the usage um, of smartphones and, and the, the integrated GPS systems, it just made logical sense to us that we need to be on the front end of this rather than the back end. And now with this being standard equipment on so many fire truck manufacturers, I, I don't know that we're gonna have a choice in the future, which is a good thing. Yeah. At some point, if this becomes the safety feature that we need, then everyone should adopt it. And even if they don't check the box on the order form on that next truck, it's just gonna show up. And, and I think we're getting close to that point. Yeah, and, and to that point, Chief, I mean, all those manufacturers are, are including this as a standard safety feature, yeah. right? They're not, it's not an upcharge to the right. end customer. Um, so they'd have to be taking away a, a free safety feature. Yeah. Um, and, and how do you explain that to, you know, your, your, your town? Yeah. We did have one other question that, that came in is, and maybe this is on both sides of the platform, but when do we expect integration of other navigation services and applications? Yeah, I can, I can take that. Um, you know, we're, uh, you know, Hustler, we're, we're talking to, you know, the other navigation platforms and traffic, you know, traffic providers, um, you know, without, I can't divulge too much because of the, you know, and, you know, non-disclosure reasons, but, uh, you know, we're, we're making some really good progress with some of the other larger, you know, larger companies that are out there. Um, and also with the car manufacturers, you know, we've got about four or five projects going on right now 
um, with uh, w- you know, with them. Um, I, I could see by the end of this year, you know, us having our first car manufacturer um, integrating these alerts into their vehicles. Um, so we're 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 well on the way to to you know, expanding that beyond uh, you know, the Waze platform, All right? And, and we and we know that that's the number one uh, you know, piece of feedback that we get from departments. Like you know, literally, they're like, "Hey, it's great that you have Waze. You know, when is Google going to come on? When is Apple going to come on? When are the cars going to start to have this?" Um, so that's that's my full time job is to. You get get these guys, uh, you know, excited and uh, and willing to invest in safety as well, right? Because it's a safety feature for their drivers also. Um, it's it's not just a feel good story to to help first responders. It's helping their customers as well be safer while they're driving. It's got a great question from Richard Miller. Thanks for throwing it in there. How will self driving cars respond to Hostler? Yeah, so you know the great thing about Hostler is that we're a data feed. Right, we're we're feeding data into ways today. You know, these these self-driving cars can take that same data uh, and uh, and add that to their 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 algorithms and their their computer that's sitting in the vehicle to better understand what's going on around them. Um, you know, we, you know, in talking to some of the the leading autonomous vehicle companies that are out there, um, they say that they can only reliably detect an emergency vehicle um, through sirens and, and light detection. Um, within two to two and a half seconds away from a, a you know a, from that the, that autonomous vehicle, uh, with our signal, you know, they can get a 15, 20 second advance warning. That that reliability that their computers are then you know crunching the you know the information from can increase that to you know to five to ten seconds away um, to to give that that vehicle more confidence that that is in fact a responding emergency vehicle. So that's a very valuable data that they'll be using uh, to do that. Yep. Chief, uh, Chief. audio went out for a sec. Sorry, we're having some feedback, so I muted. So we actually reached out to Jeremy and his team because we had some autonomous vehicles downtown doing doing some beta testing for almost a year now, running different loops. And we had with our uh, Bridge Street Fire Station several instances where the safety attendant had to uh, take control of the vehicle or assist the uh, the autonomous vehicle to, to get out of our way based on the, the weird traffic patterns and some five o'clock traffic that we were dealing with. And we said, you know what? Obviously we can't communicate directly via sirens or lights. We need something else to do it. And we really kicked off those conversations with Haas. And as we start to see more and more autonomous vehicles going down the road, I think this is gonna be how we communicate with them. I, I really do. And even look at like some of the Teslas, right? They're, they're slamming into the back of parked fire trucks and ambulances and police cars on the side of the road. You know, the, a lot of those cars are on, you know, autopilot, um, you know, the, using that technology. So um, it's, a, it's a known deficiency in that, in that autopilot technology to be able to see stationary vehicles like that. So, you know, we're, 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 there's definitely a big need for that in the future, not just, not just for the driver world, but also the driverless world. So this is filling a really big gap for the driverless world. Yes, for sure. Interesting. Another good question coming in from a rural, uh, rural firefighter, fire chief. Um, what uh, does this work in rural areas that don't have cell service? And I mean, is this a, even something that can run on FirstNet? Um, can you talk about how this might work with areas with little to no cell service? Yeah. So, so it does rely on cellular network connectivity. So that, that transponder that I showed. You know, it has an, an embedded cellular modem, and it does communicate with the with the LTE network uh, around the country. So, you know, if if there's just zero cell service available, um, then 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 the service unfortunately won't work in that area. Um, you know, FirstNet is just kind of another uh, you know uh, first responder specific network. Um, you know, so long as there's you know FirstNet coverage there, and you know in the future we'll, we will have a FirstNet compatible device, um, then you know it'll work off of off of FirstNet as well. Uh, but but yeah, there, that is the one technical dependency that our system has is that there has to be cellular service uh, to be able to transmit um, you know, very small amount of data. It's not a lot of data that we're sending, um, so we don't need you know five G technology to to stream video from the device. It, it's a really small amount of data, uh, which which allows us to have really quick uh, communication you know to and from the vehicles. Mm. Great so like, question. Well, just yeah. like one G maybe, or you know, what do we need? Like literally, it could work off of two G or three G. It doesn't. You know, LTE is just since it's around, we you know we're using that. Good. So, uh, just kind of generally to both of you, and obviously this is the whole topic of discussion has been digital alerting, 
and we just had a nice uh, conversation just about autonomous vehicles. But what do you see as the future of digital digital learning and enhancing road safety, whether it's one year from now, five years from now, 15 years from now, super over-ended, what do you see as a future uh, moving forward here? Chief, do you, wanna, do you wanna start? Do you want me to take it? Both yeah. of you. Uh, it's actually, I'm actually giving a talk on that next week at a uh, okay. automated automated driving uh, ADAS conference. Um, look, you know, at some point in the future, you know, all vehicles are going to communicate directly with each other, right? There won't there won't be a need for uh, an intermediary to broker the communication between the vehicles. Um, you know, we personally think that that time frame is going to be a lot longer. Um, uh, you know, if you if you look at the cars on the road today. You know, not everyone's driving 2018 vehicles, right? There's vehicles that are, you know, well, you know, much older than that. Um, so there's going to be a, a pretty significant time period where this newer vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle technology is going to start to creep in, but uh, but there will be a need for effectively like a translator, you know, something that can um, you know help the vehicles communicate with each other that are you know, kind of using different languages, if you will. Um, and so this, this need for a, a cloud system to be able to you know, be that translation service uh, will, will, I, I think will be there you know, for at least the remainder of this decade, um, if not you know, well into the next decade as well. Well put. Well, I was really hoping to have Chief Brown. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happened. He dropped off. Here, right? you know, maybe, maybe his, uh, his maybe a uh, call came in. connection or his uh, one or two or three G wasn't mm. strong enough. Um, <laughs> So unfortunately, unfortunately, we lost him. I, I can't even begin to try and capture what he would say. Yeah. Uh, but I, to kind of sum up what he would say, I think it kind of comes down to just the fact that we need to keep our first responders safe in every way possible. And this is a very easy means of actually accomplishing that. And luckily, we got uh, Chief Brown here who's rejoining us. He's back, baby. Chief Brown, you there? Uh oh. Hello? Jeremy, can you hear me? Or, uh, I can hear you, yeah. It looks like he's a little lagging for me as well. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, could be um, just yeah, some bad Wi Fi. Just about to finish off here. So that was yeah. unfortunate that we, I thought we were uh, going scotch free here on this webinar <laughs> software today. Um, but uh, again, did, I think as me trying to capture Chief Brown's message is anything we can do to keep first responders safer and yeah. keep trucks on the road, we need to do that. Um, this is something that isn't rocket science. And the fact that this can operate in the background and you set it, forget it, truly don't have to do anything for it, yeah. um, is something that is is in, uh, impressive to me. Yeah. So I uh, encourage you all to check out this link. We'll, we'll send it out afterwards to, if you can rewatch this, share it out, but there's, um, you can go to the Hostler website um, Chief Brown has got some great things going on within his uh, department's website. There's there's a lot of other um, videos and information going on here, and um, I'm gonna give uh, Chief Brown. We'll we'll give him the the a little maybe one more chance here to get off and on again. But um, and, and I'll, I'll say too, we we Hustler is offering uh, offers 30 day pilots, free pilots, you know, for those that want to try out the service, um, who are you know interested in. It. Um, you know, it's very easy for us to send out a device or two to the department and you know, get it installed and, and have it running for 30 days. So um, more than happy to, you know, to offer that to the group here as well. Chief Brown, we got you back? Yeah, I, I think so. All right. So much, for, so much for rural fire departments not having coverage, yeah. right? I must be able to be here. Give us one last final mic drop here and your the future of road safety. What, and just off the cuff, what do you got? It's not about how loud your sirens are or how bright your lights are. It's about communicating effectively with the medium that gets the attention of the driver. Obviously, we're not gonna go away from lights and sirens, but it, that was not feeling the, the need in today's driving community. And I think digital learning is the wave of the future. We're just happy to be on the front end and experience these benefits as uh, they come along. Well put. I tried filling in for you, and I butchered <laughs> it completely. And oh, I'm sure you rocked it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, well, well, well put. And to Jeremy's point as well, you can get a free uh, trial. So if you want to just show it, uh, I think you could see from the report you can show that you can alert people, and if you can go.
go to your city council and say, we alerted a hundred people this month that we were again, sitting outside. That's some good, that's actual a tangible data set that you can okay. use. Not everything is as tangible as that. So, um, and, and, we, and we give you a monthly report as well. So we, we treat you get access to the dashboard. I mean, we, we really treat you like a full customer during that trial period. Yep. Um, there's one last question and then we'll get out of here. Is there a thought to have Hostler become part of the navigation algorithm so it also reroutes cars rather than just alerting them? Yeah, I mean, look, ideally that would be great, right? Um, if you can convince Waze and Google and Apple and, and all those guys to do that, you know, use our data that way, that'd be awesome. Um, you, know, I, you know, that's really up to them how they make use of, of our signal, right, uh, of the alert that we're triggering to them. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily think all alerts or all, all situations re require a complete rerouting. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, every, every situation is different, but you know, you're, I think your, your head's in the right space, right? How do you make better use of this information you know, beyond just a warning to the driver? What else can we do with it? Um, and, that, and that's a great example. Mm -hmm. Cool. I'll call Google really quick and tell them what's up. There you go. One last question. Are there any systems working in uh, Mass Massachusetts departments? Uh, yeah, we've got, uh, we've got f uh, three or four departments right now in Massachusetts that are doing it. Um, I think a lot of them are in kind of the Metro Boston and, and kind of Southeast region. Um, so yeah, we've got a, a Quincy and Plainville, Quincy and Plainville, uh, and then maybe a couple others that I'm just uh, forgetting right now. Cool. Well, Alex McCurdy, um, if you want to learn more, reach out to Jeremy direct, but to all of you that joined us here today, Bob Welch, Jeff Doolin, some of the Darley team, Hostler team, Jennifer Collins, Emily, Noah. Um, you guys are awesome. You're the reason why we host these events. We want to continue to host more of these vir virtual smart firefighting chats. We have one next week on health and wellness in the fire service on Thursday. So I encourage you all to check that out. We're going to be doing these hopefully at least once a month, twice a month. So slide into our DMs and let us know what you want. Um, you can email me at kevinsofin at darley.com. Jeremy put his email there as well. Um, we can get you in contact with Chief Brown if you want. For but sure. well, everyone, have a great and safe Tuesday. Stay well yeah. and um, take care. Much love.